We've been going over the list of the Buddha's approaches for dealing with the asavas. There are seven in all. Remember, the asavas come in a set of three. There's the affluent of sensuality, the affluent of becoming, and the affluent of ignorance. The first of the approaches, seeing, i.e. seeing in terms of appropriate attention, is applied to abandoning the affluence of becoming and ignorance, because you're putting aside questions that deal with your identity, which is the kernel of becoming, and focusing instead on seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. That puts an end to ignorance. The next four approaches deal with the asset of sensuality. There's restraint of the senses reflecting on the requisites as you use them. Tolerating pain, painful words, painful feelings, and avoiding dangers. That leaves two more approaches. And these deal with all of the asavas. The first is destroying. A thought of sensuality comes up in the mind, a thought of ill will, a thought of harmfulness, or any unskillful quality. You put an end to it. You don't just sit there and watch it. You may have to watch it for a while to understand it, but it's watching it as a spy would watch an enemy. You watch it until you can see the enemy's weak points, then you attack. And the other approach is developing. In this case, it's developing the seven factors for awakening. You start with mindfulness, and mindfulness leads to analysis of qualities. In other words, you're mindful to stick with your frame of reference, and then whatever comes up in, in the context of that frame of reference, whether it's the body or your feelings or the mind or mental qualities, you try to figure out what's skillful and what's not skillful. That leads to the next factor for awakening, which is persistence. Once you see that something is unskillful, you try to abandon it. If it's skillful, you try to maintain it, develop it. That will ideally lead finally to a sense of rapture as the mind gets more and more at peace, as unskillful qualities are pulled away. From the rapture then comes calm. calm comes concentration, and from concentration you get equanimity. These two sets, the destroying and the developing, go together, because there is that aspect throughout the path. As you're developing good qualities in the mind, you're basically creating a state of becoming. But then other becomings are going to come up in the mind, and you can't let them destroy the good state that you're trying to develop here. For example, when you're practicing mindfulness and concentration, you've got to stay with your frame of reference. Say, yes, it's the breath as we're focusing on right now. And then you have to put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Any thoughts that come up with reference to the world that would pull you out of this frame of reference, you've got to put them aside. When yeah, yeah, you put them aside or you discipline them, get them under control. But basically, you can't let them come in and destroy what you're trying to build here, because the path is something you built. It's a sankhara, it's a fabrication. And as with all fabrications, it has a tendency to start dissolving away, and so you've got to work at it. In fact, this pattern of destroying and developing can cover everything that we do on the path. In the Sutta on the customs of the Noble Ones, the Buddha talks about delighting in developing and delighting in abandoning. And the commentators say that this covers everything in the Dharma. In fact, it covers these two activities go so well together that you can actually say that 
the destroying is actually part of the developing. It's there in the persistence. And through them together, cover the, all the factors of the Eightfold Path. The destroying includes right resolve, all of the factors for virtue, right speech, right action, right livelihood, because these things depend on maintaining skillful intentions and not acting on unskillful ones. And it's part of right effort, the destroying part. As for the seven factors for awakening, you've got right view in analysis of qualities. And the whole set of seven shows how the practice of mindfulness under the influence of right view then leads to right concentration. So you've got everything together right here. So why does the Buddha tease everything out in terms of seven approaches? Well, partly it's to remind you of how these factors of developing and destroying can apply, even in some simple things like how you eat, how you look at your wardrobe, the decisions you make about your wardrobe, the decisions you make about the place you're going to live, how much energy you want to put into these things. How developing and destroying applied simply to how you look at things, how you look away from things, how you listen to things, how you don't listen to things, or the way in which you listen to something that's coming your way that you can't avoid. By teasing things out in terms of these other approaches, it shows you you've got to see how everything you do is related either to increasing the affluence that are going to lead you to stay stuck in suffering and samsara, or decreasing them opening the path to getting away. And then as the path develops, that faculty of seeing reminds you that you've got to reflect. This relates to another simple formula that the Buddha used to talk about the path. He said the Dharma comes from commitment and reflection. So in committing yourself to the various approaches for dealing with the asavas. You're putting out energy. You're making an effort. And then you've got to reflect, because as you're making an effort, you're taking responsibility for your actions. This is really important. Sometimes you hear that this is a path where you have to tell yourself you're not doing the path, because if you think that you are doing the path, that's wrong view, because it's getting engaged in a sense of self. But the Buddha never encourages that attitude when he talks in terms of mindfulness. Something unskillful inside you comes up, you say, this hindrance, say, of sensual desire is present in me. When he talks to an Rahula about reflecting on his actions, he says, this action I want to do, this action I am doing, this action I have done. You use that sense of I in order to remind yourself that you are responsible. You're taking responsibility. This is not a path where things just happen on their own. You think of the Buddha's images. The main ones have to do with victory in battle or the mastering of a skill. To be a victor in battle, on the one hand, you do have to develop your strengths, and you've got to eliminate the enemy. You don't just sit there and let things happen on a battlefield. Similarly with mastering a skill. You have to develop all the various skills. You have to get rid of the mind states that would wander away, get lazy, think about other things when you should be having your mind focused on your work. Because that chair you're making, or that dish of food you're making, it's not going to make itself. You've got to make it. And you've got to work on developing certain qualities inside and abandoning other ones. But you do that also by reflecting on what you're doing. As a good soldier, you reflect on what has worked in battles in the past. As a good craftsman, you reflect on what's worked in the chairs you've made in the past or the dishes of food you've made in the past. And you learn by reflecting. In the same way, that 
approach of seeing, seeing things in terms of appropriate attention, monitors what you're doing with all these other approaches. And finally, when they've done their work, the factors for awakening have been fully developed. Unskillful qualities in the mind have been abandoned and destroyed. That's when you remind yourself, okay, there has to be something beyond becoming. Still looking in terms of the Four Noble Truths. You remember that fourth truth has to be developed, and then it too has to be put aside. So in that case, the approach of seeing in terms of appropriate attention reflects back on what you've been developing and abandoning. So it's good to have all this teased out into seven different approaches to see how every little thing you do as you go through the day is related to us of us one way or another. It's not a concept we think about that much, what's flowing out of your mind right now. When we're attuned to what's coming in. But this is the whole purpose of having these approaches, to see how much you are shaping things and how you can do a better job. This is what the Buddha says, it's important to delight in abandoning and to delight in developing and trying to find a, an environment in which you can do that as you live in the world outside. They try to lure you into their activities by making you a delight in wealth and status, praise, sensual pleasures, the ways of the world. But then the ways of the world, if the world offered nothing but that, it wouldn't be a bad place. But it offers a lot of the opposite as well. There's loss of wealth, loss of status, criticism, pain. And so they make you forget yourself as you get pulled into these other things. And what the Buddha wants you to do is turn around and look at what you are doing, what's flowing out of your mind. Solve that problem. And you can find something that has no drawbacks at all. So appreciate the fact that you're in an environment. You've got some seclusion, and we can focus on the issues of what you need to develop in the mind, what you need to abandon in the mind. And these things take top priority. And if you don't have an environment like that, well, look for one. Because it makes things a lot easier. And in the meantime, really do the best you can to encourage yourself to delight in developing and to delight in abandoning or destroying, as the, that one approach says. Because as the Buddha said elsewhere, that kind of delight leads to the ending of the influence. And that's the goal. Because the ending of effluence is right there on the, the verge of unbinding, total freedom, without any drawbacks at all.